but also sometimes I will turn like moderation or questions could yeah. come in Armenian. So be in English channel to also have interpretation of all those Armenian things. Kuzanam vor usanov nere yevas linen antren aveli jist ein alike vor etzanka numen lesel higher ni debkum yet etzanka mek higher en lesel apa interpretation kochaka yegra gandi pes nishane sech mek yevan trek franser en bajina ein ter mek kelesen higher en tarkmanutun yet etzanka mek original tarberakov apa chentrum en trek angler en tarberaka el voshte ait of vijaka shnora kalutun I saw Mengun and Alang Banahos Snet, Banahos Nere Yereknen. Is Minchevite, yes, Hoska Pohansem, Informatia Yazar Chankendroni, Nahagashusha Doidoanin, Yev Menk, Karwink, Serano, Amarel Arten, Meknarkats. Havastianal, words I nagru Menk, Manajan, Apahovel, Harutsunjan, Vortune Bolorin, Shatura. I'm really happy to have this occasion of meeting you online. And this is the last session, uh, the last online session in the series. This time we have invited two of our international experts, Woody Smithy and Tom Munch, because this is how Tom Eck signs his works. Uh, they have been uh, here, <clears throat> especially Tom was here and he was very closely following what was happening in the conflict zone and was um, covering the events on the front line and along the front line. And Woody was here right after the war. He was here for quite a long period of time doing his professional duties and actively collaborating with Armenian professionals. He, uh, Karine uh, from A1 Plus is here and Woody was closely collaborating with him. I would like to say that the whole process was implemented by, with the support of Danish International Media Support Organization. And uh, within the framework of media mentoring program. Uh, and uh, FOICA is collaborating with this project with uh, Yerevan State University's journalism faculty, the, the aim of which is to organize discussions with pre-service and e-service journalists, focusing on the main obligations and rights of journalists covering conflicts, as well as their security safeguards. And in my case, I would also like to very happily uh, speak about the problems that you might face during conflicts and conflict coverage in relation to the protection of your personal data. I would gladly give the floor to Mr. Nash Martirosian, the Dean of the Journalism Faculty at Yerevan State University for his welcome address. And then we will already listen to our colleagues, the international professionals. Uh, uh, hello, Mrs. Doidoyan, I would like to greet you. I would like to uh, greet and to thank our presenters who really impressed us with their professionalism and the content that they delivered. I would like to also greet our students, our colleagues, uh, especially those students who are active in the journalistic profession and who are proving to their audience that uh, the best graduates are the graduates of journalism department of Yerevan State University, and they're the best professionals, obviously, in the field. I think that this initiative should have a continuation. It should sustain. It should have its offline continuation too, and it would be necessary to organize meetings with our students in their lecture halls, and they need to meet with professionals such as Woody, Tom, uh, Digran, or Nick, as we were addressing uh, yesterday, and professionals like them should be the mentors who would share their experiences 
with the students and this is the format of no formal education that should come to complement formal education and uh, the combination of two should harmonize to shape the future journalist I would like to propose Ms. Doi Doyan, before giving the floor to Harutun Zadarian, to take a group screenshot. Uh, I think that in the meantime, we'll also have a few more screenshots during the session. And I think that we will have a nice conclusion of a series of events by this two hour session. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Martirosian. That's exactly what I was going to announce. I would ask all the participants to turn on their cameras during the upcoming one, two minutes so that we see your beautiful faces and we take the screenshots and also record this very important moment and document it. And later when you watch the videos, everything becomes uh, very inspirational. So, you know, when we see people on the screen, it would be very nice. We could see that there is interaction. If not, we feel that um, it's still and there is no movement, but this is very nice. Uh, Mr. Odeon, just try a few times so that myself and Woody are able to uh, put our hair right so that we look nice on the screenshot. Okay, thank you very much. And Harut, I would like to give um, the floor to you because you're the moderator. You were yeah, all thank ears. you. Thank you, Shushan. In fact, to the participants. Uh, as we have two English uh, native language speakers, I will uh, moderate in English. If uh, if you need to have translation, please be sure that you are in channel French for Armenian translation. So uh, as I uh, said in the beginning, we are going to have uh, first 20, 25 minutes from each speaker a presentation. Then we are going to have this round table and Q&A session. So first I would give a uh, floor to Woody. Woody, please take floor. If you need to present something, just let me know and I can make you like a co-host or, or the one who can present. If you see that a screen sharing is not possible, just let me know, okay? because I know you have something to present, yeah? Yeah, no problem. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, and good to see you again. I will try to share uh, the screen with you guys. Uh, not sure if this is going to happen, but can everybody see my screen? Yeah, happens. we yeah. do have. Yeah, we okay, do have. Okay, cool. And you can see a yellow page in my screen, right? Okay, great. I will just hide my floating controls and hide the video. Cool. Right. We're going to go on the show. So for, I think some of you knows me, but for those who don't, I'm a documentary photographer and journalist that's interested in, in conflicts since 2007, covered mainly Middle East, North Africa, and uh, also sometimes in Europe with certain investigative projects. And um, the latest one, the, the 40, 40 days of war in Nagorno-Karabakh, mainly I was focused in the aftermath of the conflict. So we're now gonna talk about the conflict reporting and certain issues that, have, that are related to your uh, uh, ethical code of conduct and the way you, you produce your stories. And also we're gonna focus on, on safety. And then after the presentation, you're more than welcome to address questions or have your comments and so on and so forth. So in any conflict reporting, rumors, scaremongering and urban myths can quickly become an accepted as facts. This is something we as journalists or reporters being on the ground, do not let it happen. For example, one of the things I'd like to remind every one of us is do not believe everything someone tells you in, 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 the middle of, in the middle of a conflict. For example, you have a number of international non-governmental organizations 
as they are shortly known by definition as NGOs, they usually and always are in the side of the victim, but as a kind of an under, underdog. So they are keen to generate interest and in their perspective. Uh, they have a story to tell, of course. Uh, often the story is very shocking in its own right, as always is. However, this is something that you should always be careful, uh, something you can't really rely upon, but you cannot, have, you cannot ignore it. Uh, what, what NGOs are saying, because they, they usually refer uh, to the eyewitnesses on the ground. And eyewitnesses is something you may have to always verify. It doesn't really matter what circumstance, circumstances or the situation is. Don't hunt for the definitive truth when you are in a conflict. So the truth is out there and it's, it's quite difficult to find but as a journalist, unless you've experienced the situation firsthand, meaning that you've been there when an airstrike, let's say, happened and you've seen all, then you know you can report it as, as, as a plain truth as it is. So, however, when people tell you stories, as I said previously, in terms of, of, of uh, witnesses, take their testimony in, the cons in consideration, but seek evidence, be very cautious, and of course, do not fall on local or international pressures and do not seek evidence to prove your established opinion. This is very important. For example, before you go in a conflict, you don't establish an opinion about what's happening there. You research information, you gather as much knowledge as possible and you do not form an opinion. You go to seek evidence. Don't accept information without question. Facts are loaded. Some will show you that, let's say, 5.4 million people have died in a conflict. But do you know how that figure was, re uh, was achieved? How, how somebody created the kind of figure, you know? If, if you don't know what period the statistic covers, then just don't use it. Try to verify, of course, but try to avoid using statistics that you are told by either individuals that are just members of public or individuals that are also uh, representing certain, certain organization that is part of the war or the government body. Uh, try to verify pretty much everything that you're told and understand the methodology, the, statistic, the statistics are created. That's very important for you. Don't forget the human face of suffering. We all know sexual violence and rape are terrible crimes in the midst of war, but when reporting, don't forget that all the headlines and stories that are written also have a human face because pretty much every single individual that's behind a pen and paper, a photo camera, behind a truck that's driving to supply with food, people that are trapped in war, or people that are behind the guns, they're also human beings. So it's really important to check up on that angle also. Don't be sloppy with words. This is something that it's very important to be careful with the language that we use. For example, genocide is a specific legal term with a particular meaning. It does not automatically follow that because a large number of people have been killed, it's a genocide. So is the case with terms of such as crimes and war crimes against humanity and other matters that are related to the war. So when you use terms that, are, that have a legal meaning and political meaning, please be careful to understand that substantially you are well covered with what you're saying. So that means if, if you're not careful, you will be sloppy with words and eventually being a journalist on the ground, you might have troubles with your editor or the fact checking department of the newspaper you're working with. Cool, we're going to the next slide. I don't know why this is not working. The next thing is don't be led by another's agenda. So it's all about kind of timing. Some kind of pressure groups will often release certain information before you publish a story. And that might make you feel like, oh my God, I got it wrong. But do you do have to understand that you may have not gotten it wrong if you tested, if, if you witnessed it yourself. You may have not gotten it wrong if you verify the information by yourself through your own methodologies. 
So certain, certain groups of interest, be it NGO or United Nations Security Council, they might have their own agenda and they might have their own ways of releasing certain information in a certain way. So you have to stick to your own story, how you verified yourself and how you got it through to get it published. So do not, do not be afraid of, of, of course, don't ignore them. Take, of course, you should be considerate to that, but just, just, just don't, don't let yourself be, be led by other, other, other forms of pressure. Don't ignore the local pressures. Although you're a foreign reporter, you can face with censorship or self-censorship. They're often not able to report what they would like to. In this case, the reporters being in a foreign country. However, if you've seen and verified a certain story by yourself, regardless how certain individuals address to you and approach you and see you and say to certain things to you in form of pressure to like prevent you from reporting certain things, you should not, you should not give up on them. However, you should not ignore them. You should be considering that they are a real possible and potential threat because if you are in an active war zone, people can lose their patience because there is so many other circumstances what may that what may have led them to think in a certain way and if they are not afraid to harass and threaten you it is likely that they may not be afraid to actually do what they think they should do in order to stop you doing certain things so you should never ignore them be considerate however you shouldn't give up in de in defending and standing by your own professional ethics and code of conduct. And what's very important, don't ignore the history. So journalism should not be an accumulation of cliches ending with latest addition to the mix. Uh, you just have to think originally, you just have to talk to people and verify what they say, possibly people who are qualified to speak about certain things of historical matters of the country, however, you should verify them. You should face these, these and challenge these, these, uh, these testimonies and evidences, evidence with, with possible international writers that may have been writing about certain things in relating, in relating to a particular country's history and the history of the conflict. So it's really important to give to an international audience a context of what led to the conflict. What was it before? And how is the situation now? This is a short video where we're jumping into talking about the safety and preparation, but I'm just not gonna play it. Oh, sorry. So going in a war zone, we'll have to keep in mind that, as I say, we'll have to, we must be alive. This is not a myth. This is a matter of how we are prepared and how cautious we are towards our knowledge that we gather throughout the trainings. You have to be physically and mentally prepared. What I mean by physically is you really have to be kind of doing some access, physical exercise before, before you go in a war zone. And mentally is you have to understand and acknowledge that you're going in a war zone a place where bombs and bullets fly, not cakes and strawberries. Uh, a place where people have guns in their hands and they can pull, can pull the trigger in any given second they wish. Whatever the circumstance led them to decide to pull the trigger on you. So you have to be prepared for the matter of fact that you can die or you can be abducted, you can be tortured. These are things you have to agree with and say, okay, this can happen, however, I'm going to go and I'm going to consider my knowledge and be aware with information that I have, how to stay alive, how to avoid getting into such situations. As I said previously, most conflict zones require an inability to at least to run, hike and endure discomfort. If possible, go on a hostile environment course 
that includes basic first aid training and security training before your assignment. So it's really important that you going in a war zone, you really need to know from firsthand experienced people what it means like to be in a hostile environment zone and what it means like to, to, to possibly be hurt or injured and have and how to use the first first aid uh, uh, knowledge and your your first aid kit that you will be having you, you will have to carry with you in case you get injured in in a, in a war zone. I provide those trainings with hostile environment training course in London. Um, uh, you can check on my website. I will move on. So. The matter of safety and conflict reporting is also you need to know the background of the place, the people and the dispute. You need to learn a few phrases in the local language, including the words foreign press and journalist. You also need to know certain phrases and forms of communication if somebody's possibly plotting to abduct you or plotting to get you to, to be sold to some kind of groups of interest and so on and so forth. But one thing what's important is you should try to avoid to let local people know that you actually speak the language, just so they are completely safe feeling that knowing that you don't understand their language, they will speak freely with their own way and their own local and their own context people, whatever they think about you, whatever they, they wanna do with you, if there is any, 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 any threat towards you, you will easily be detecting it if they don't know that you speak their own local language. So it's, it's, your, it's your safety net. Know the meaning of the local gestures that might be very important. You know, uh, some countries, for example, the response of the word, yes, I'm not sure if everybody is seeing me, but they, they, nod, they nod their head from, up, uh, from, um, from left to right to say yes. Although generally everybody thinks and assumes that the yes means nodding your head from up down or from down up and vice versa. So you should really, really try to understand a possible meaning of, of the local gestures. Ensure you have the appropriate jabs and are carrying a basic medical kit. What I mean about jab, it's um, there are certain diseases that may be permanent at certain country and different countries of the world. There are also certain insects that might be uh, in different countries of the world that if, if they bite you, you might be in serious trouble. So it's really important that you have to have appropriate jabs done and you need to carry with you basic medical kit, which also could include a so about five needles because if you go in a particular country and you are in trouble in uh, in health troubles that country might be practicing to reuse needles and you don't want a needle to be reused in your body in case you 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 come into a situation where you need um emergency you need you need you need a hospital or ambulance to to support you Consider wearing an internationally recognized bracelet with a catasis symbol and carry a record of allergies and your blood group. This is really important in case you get badly wounded or lightly wounded, doesn't really matter. In case you get wounded in a situation where you would need to go to the hospital or you would need somebody to um, provide you with a, with a first aid in the, in, on the spot you really need to, that person need to really know these information. Don't ever let a person that doesn't know what they're doing try to provide you a first aid in the moment when you are possibly wounded. Unless if they can, of course, apply pressure on the wound to stop the bleeding. That's all for me today. Yeah, that's nice that Woody, you manage to make everything on time and that's perfect actually managing the time. So uh, let's uh, give floor now to Tom, Nicholas Much, and then after his presentation, we will have Shushan and please students and 
uh, working journalists who are active in the field, please prepare your question and surely we will have this part for the question, okay? Thanks once again, Woody. Uh, Nick, now please unmute yourself, I see, and start the presentation part, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Everything. You can hear me fine because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not everything. showing up as muted. Yeah, everything is fine, yeah. Okay, cheers. Well, so just very, very quickly, thank you very much, Voodie, for your very, your excellent and informative speech. Uh, hopefully, I can live up to it to some extent. I have less experience than Voodie, only having done military research and been active in conflict zones since around 2015. I also probably have a slightly different experience to what he has, as the conflict zones I have focused on have been both post-Soviet conflict zones, such as in Eastern Ukraine or in the Karabakh conflict, which I was in last year, or civil crises and conflicts in Latin America, such as those in Colombia and in Venezuela. And for my talk, I want to take a number of examples. Uh, my, my talk, I'm going to focus mainly on journalist safety and how to keep yourself safe. And I'm going to take a couple of ex examples from my own career where I came under some quite serious threat. And I wanna talk about the things I did right and the things I did wrong. And hopefully you can take some lessons from those incidents and I also apologize to anyone who was watching me yesterday or who has seen my uh, Media Initiative Center lecture a number of months ago that some of this will be retreading the same ground. I hope you can maybe at least find something else of value out of it. So the first hostile situation I want to focus on is the situation in Artsakh that have, of course, the, the bombings and the shellings and the extremely intense war that was happening last year. Now, I know many of you are practicing journalists and I am sure that a good number of you will be aware or will have been to Artsakh uh, before, during and after the conflict. And absolutely everybody among you will know people who served there or who worked there and will know for sure that it was one of the most intense conflict zones that many of us had faced or covered in a long time. In fact, many of the colleagues I was working with, they had come from places like Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan and had said that day to day it was the most or some of the most intense fighting they had ever seen in their entire lives. So I want to tell you the story of when I was in Martini. We were in Martini towards the end of October and there was a great, uh, there was a convoy of around six or seven of us journalists that had decided to report on a major shelling incident that had occurred the previous day. So we took a bus to Martini. We walked around Martini for uh, several hours. And for those who were, were there, they will remember that it was literally a bomb site in the sense that there were there were debris, there was debris of houses, bricks, broken glass everywhere. You couldn't see anybody on the streets. The only sounds that you could hear were the sounds of stray dogs and cats that were still living in the city that had been abandoned by their owners and the sounds of the shell fire that you could hear going off in the distance. And our guide, our minder from the Armenian uh, military said, you don't worry if you hear an explosion because then you're okay. What you need to worry about is if you hear a drone strike. Oh, if you hear the sound of a drone overhead, pardon me. So of course, coming five or 10 minutes later, and that is exactly what we heard. And all of a sudden we had to run for shelter in a bomb shelter that was uh, where a small number of Armenian troops were still holding the line. And then we had to run as quickly as we could back to our vans. We jumped in our vans and we drove off through the outskirts of the city. And if anyone has been to Martini, they will know that there is that very famous um, 
pardon me, that, that, that poster, that billboard of Monte Melconian that was uh, erected just after the first war. And we drove past that. And as we were driving past that, all of a sudden, an enormous explosion ripped through the ground next to us. It could have knocked the bus over. It was so close. Uh, we were all a bit battered and bruised, but we were more or less unharmed. Then, not even 30 seconds later, on, our, on the other side, on our right side, in the foothills, we saw a strike by three Israeli supplied Harop suicide drones. Now, our driver uh, praised him actually because he was a very, very good driver. Just stepped on the gas, took immediate emergency evasive procedures, and just started driving as fast as he, as he could uh, in various zigzags around the road. Now, we believe some shots might have hit on the road behind us, but thankfully, we were out of danger within maybe within five to 10 minutes. And we got back to Stepanakert and we reminisced on what had happened. And everybody knew that what had happened there was what had happened to a number of colleagues that had been covering the war in Artsakh. Some of them, we believe, could have been deliberately targeted and others, we believe, were these near misses could have been some kind of a warning sign to, warning sign to journalists to stay out of the region and to not report on what was happening. Now, everyone thankfully escaped from that unscathed, but we do know of some very serious cases, especially earlier in the war where journalists had been injured. Now, we came out of that fine. So what I want to do is I want to just quickly share with you some of the lessons that I learned and brought into my own work going forward from that. As Voody said, you need to have a certain level of physical fitness. You need to be the kind of fitness that if you get into a dangerous situation, like you are coming under shell fire, or there is an enemy convoy moving towards you, that you can run, that you can run fast, and you can get out of danger. Because you never know, especially in these new conflict zones, where the front lines are often not clearly defined, and that with the, the drones that Azerbaijan had been supplied, they could easily hit behind the front lines. Another lesson is, uh, this is one I talked about in my lecture yesterday, was that, you know, at first there was the sort of thought, well, do we stay around in Martini and try and see if we can find any civilians who are behind or, or do we try and report on the shelling under it? And the group consensus was fairly quickly to say no. And we got that we knew this because we had detail because the minder who was with us had detailed information coming from troops on the front line of the movements they had seen. So there's a one point you need to know or have someone with you who knows or has some sort of contact with troops on the ground in fighting positions who can tell you minute to minute the sort of risks that you are gonna be facing from ballistics, from enemy forces, or who can tell you when you need to get out. And what that means is you also need to know very well what the relationship to journalists that the armed forces that you are with has, because we were lucky in Artsakh that the Armenian and the Nagorno-Karabakh armed forces who we were either embedded with or we were traveling with, or were visiting were generally quite sympathetic towards journalists reporting on their war. Now, I'm sure anyone who has covered the Middle East and North Africa, such as Voodi, will know for sure that there are many times where this will not be the case, and I will go in a little more into that in my next video. And I also wanted to make the case that while a lot of information is very valuable and it does need to take risk, and you do need to take risks for, no story or extra piece of journalism is really worth being terribly physically or mentally harmed or potentially even killed for. This was an example where for most of us on the ground, we came to a fairly quick decision that the discretion in this case was the better part of valor and we wanted to get out. We were also very lucky that we had a reliable driver 
who was able to take evasive maneuvers and was at knew the terrain and was able to get us out of danger as quickly as humanly possible. Now, this driver had been provided in this case by a press tour by the Nagorno-Karabakh authorities, but in other cases, you want to have a driver who has very, very good references as to their skills, preferably as a local who knows the terrain and who will know how to take evasive maneuvers and get you out of danger. I want to make, uh, for, to make a counter example in another conflict zone I was covering, I had an issue where I had been provided a driver who I had thought was reliable, but turned out to both not be a local and not have combat experience, and actually had a minor freak out and almost had a breakdown when shellfire started hitting quite close to us. He was screaming things like, oh, this is 50-50, we live, 50-50, we die. And not only was did it incapacitate him from driving briefly, it also made me quite scared of the situation and starting to lose my sort of nerve and wondering what I was doing here. And when those thoughts pile up, often you can find out that you, you, know, you could be in, in some sort of bad place. And there is a, a final lesson from this is that why is that sometimes in these zones, journalists will end up either being targeted or they will be considered by a particular enemy side as collateral as acceptable collateral damage. So do not think that your profession or your standing as a journalist is necessarily going to protect you from harm. Now, I want to talk about a second scenario, which is from earlier in my career, where I was covering the uh, crisis in Venezuela. For those who aren't as familiar with the conflict, Venezuela is currently undergoing an extremely difficult period where it's not in the same way as Artsakh was or that maybe Syria or Iraq was. It was not some form of conflict where there's defined front lines and there's shell fire and enemy forces one against another. In some ways, it's much more insidious because what happens is the country ha has a very, very oppressive if, regime that operates like a military dictatorship and a huge amount of, of criminal activity, whether it's from kidnapping gangs or extortion gangs, and the risk of crime in terms of murder and personal violence is one of the highest in the entire world. Now, when you listen to this story, bear in mind, it's from the beginning of my career, and I want you to take specifically the lessons of where I went wrong here and did put myself in unnecessary danger, and the lessons that I've learned from that and incorporated into my work later on. So I was on the border between Venezuela and Colombia, and I was planning to cross at a crossing point called San Antonio de Tachira. It's considered one of the most dangerous crossing points uh, in the world. However, I got there in the middle of the day. I had planned to meet my fixer at a small town that were at, at a small city that was a few hours drive from the border. Now, in uh, I arrived at the border at between about 12 and one o'clock thinking I'll be fine to get across within a couple of hours. I did not get across that border until about eight o'clock at night. Now, and when I got there, the city on the other side was pitch black. It was not black in the sense that, you know, you oh, there was still a few street lights working where you could see lights coming from inside people's homes. No, it was completely and utterly dark. It was, uh, if anyone was in Stepanakert during the war, it was like walking around Stepanakert at nighttime. And what we, uh, and so what I experienced there was the first thing I had to do was I had planned to take, you know, a, a driver, but the driver I had, I, I could not find. And I found out very quickly that might that there was no way to get any sort of internet or any sort of cell phone coverage. I had thought that the SIM I had bought would work, but it just wasn't. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try and see if I can take some sort of public transport. Now I was pointed uh, after asking a few people down towards where the bus station was. 
I went down there, I found it, and I looked inside the bus station. I could see, you know, this is a country that's experiencing very, very severe economic crises. And I could see the buses had broken windows, the sign had letters hanging off it. It looked like a, a disused amusement park or something. And I just had a terribly, terribly bad feeling and thought to myself, if I go in there, there's a good chance that we couldn't come out. So I decided to turn around and walk back into the city in about 30 seconds to a minute. After I started walking down, I heard gunshots coming from within that disused bus station that I was about to be in. So I basically just found the first hotel I could entered it and stayed there for the rest of the day until in the morning where I could make contact with my driver and my fixer and get to the city I was supposed to get at. And then I could report the story, which was about a migration between Venezuela and Colombia and refugees that I wanted to do. Now, here's the main thing that, here is the main lesson that you take away from this, where I, again, could have put myself in quite serious danger, is that before you go into any sort of hostile environment zone, you need to prepare a risk assessment that is as up-to-date as humanly possible. I made a crucial mistake by not, by not speaking, because the journalists I had spoken to had been in the, on the border several months before I had been there, and unbeknownst to me, there had been a rule in how, border, a rule change in how border crossings were managed. So it now took much, much longer than expected to cross that border. It led to me getting there at night at a much more dangerous time and a much more dangerous place. Secondly, I relied far too much on individual on the technologies that I had thought had worked everywhere else in my career. I didn't have some sort of a satellite phone or a GPS locator, and I didn't have a reliable way to communicate with my fixer. Now, this is very, in effect, this is the sort of stuff that you need to take quite seriously in your work, or you risk putting yourself in serious danger. And a more general note, to point on that is that you should always trust your gut instinct or at least to the greatest extent that you can simply because your gut instinct will often tell you whether a situation is right or wrong and how to approach it and whether you should go down that road or that back street and how much that is really worth to you and in this case I'm very glad I listened to my intuition because I am now you know, safe and well enough to do future reporting, and I can never make those sort of elementary mistakes again. Now, um, my, my session time is almost up, but I just did want to leave with one small anecdote, which is when I was in a major European city, and I was at a local news organization outside meeting with a local journalist and all of a sudden I heard gunfire coming from a bridge in front of me I turned around and there must have been 100 150 people screaming and running towards me now I grabbed my camera and I made my way towards the bridge to see what was going on and it turned out there had been a major terrorist attack now this major European city was London now, London, and I was at the headquarters of the Sunday Times, and I was on London Bridge. Now, the vast majority of people would not think of, you know, London as, as the sort of place that is any kind of conflict zone or hostile environment zone. But the point I'm making there is one that is sort of twofold for the careers in this sort of reporting. One is that dangerous and difficult situations can spring up anywhere at any time in your work and you should always be prepared one to deal with them but two you should always have your reporting equipment on you and I happened to be one of the first reporters who got there on the scene and I was interviewed on tv about it and it was quite valuable for me so that as I said the, the twofold lesson is always be prepared wherever you are for these sort of eventualities to spring up because they may be very useful for you and they may keep you your liar you oh, pardon me and they may save your life and your physical and your mental well-being that's all from me for now but i'm happy to take any sort of questions on my experiences or or my knowledge and i'll hand the floor back over
Yeah, thank you, Tom, for sharing your experience regarding to Artsakh and also Venezuela. I do think that our journalists, uh, the ones who are active in field and the ones who haven't been a part of your presentation or Woody's presentation uh, during this month, I mean, already we are in April, yeah, it was in March. So uh, let's first gather question from our attendees, journalists, and then we will go to Shushan and presentation from her side, as I think this part is much more about like a real conflict reporting, hostile environment, and also safety and security of journalists. So if we do have questions from our attendees, working journalists, please, the floor is yours. Just a small technical thing, just raise your hand on Zoom. So I will give you floor uh, asking you to unmute yourself, okay? Not to have this kind of very, you know, random stuff with questions. Just uh, click on the raise hand button and then I will give you the floor and you can ask question to the speakers, to Tom and Woody. Yeah, so do we have questions? And also the questions can be in Armenian, so there is no need to be worried because the translation is going to be provided to our guest speakers. Yeah. Mm, I see no hands raised. Oh, Karine, do you have a question? Oh, no. Okay, that wasn't. Yeah. So, do we have questions? I see no. So, then I, maybe I can start my presentation. Yeah, okay. That, that's also possible. Maybe the questions will follow after your presentation, Shushan. Before you are starting, you have been asked yet yeah, to share the screen uh, regarding the thing. Yeah. I like this photo. Let us show this to our participants. This yeah, is sure. the colleagues photos in the shelter in Stepanakert. I think you can see it's yeah. impressive uh, when journalists gather uh, in the shelter to protect to be protected from being shelled. You see everyone in in the middle you can see our Nick. Yeah, everyone is dressed uh, in jacket and helmet and um, well protected. So waiting when the shelling will be over, I think. You remember yeah. those days, Nick? <laughs> Thank you, Harujan. And um, can I ask you to grant me access so that I can share my screen to- You can, you can, sure you can. Yeah, you have the opportunity to share. Let me, let me try again. You just need <laughs> what it says. If I, if I uh, send you the presentation, it doesn't so need to. Please check, please check once again, because you are one of the co-hosts. Okay. My screen is, is available? Do you see my screen? Not now, but mm -mm. maybe I can send you the yeah, it, presentation. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, just send me, and I see Woody has a question, right? <laughs> um, if I just, if I could just provide a little sort of feedback reaction about the the picture, we well, some of us who who've been reporting from the Middle East, um, we have a case when, when um, publishing material in social media in the meantime, when you are inside the active war zone, it's proven to be a very dangerous thing. It's thought to be a very dangerous thing before. And, and eventually it is also proven to be a very dangerous thing to do. So my advice based on my experience is please do not post anything in social media in the time when you are inside the active war zone because with or without your awareness that will reveal the data of your location and 
you will never know which social media company have some sort of a secret uh, agreements with certain governments that might not be the very government that's involved in the particular war, but it could be a third and third and third party selling the information. And that's, that's quite a significant risk. Yeah. Thanks. So I will stop sharing this once again. Um, do we have questions? I see the chat. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I will. I will start first. I need to download. Let you know when to change the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, I will make my presentation in Armenian. Yes, I will naturally speak Armenian, and somehow I failed to share my presentation. From my computer and now Harut will do it for me and the main topic you know it is one of my most favorite topics as to how to ensure the protection of your personal data and both in the course of conflict coverage and in general when uh, performing professional duties as a journalist excellent you can see it already i will be very brief in presenting the major issues that uh, need to be paid close attention to by the journalists when they're performing their professional duties uh, and when they're dealing with personal data. By the way, uh, I would like to split this issue into uh, two halves, into two parts. So the uh, report as a subject is an entity whose personal data needs to be protected on the one hand, and the reporter is a person who accumulates, processes, as publishes uh, personal data. That is to say, the journalist here has a legal role uh, in terms of the implementation and enforcement of the law on personal data protection. On the one hand, we need to ensure the protection of the reporter's personal data. On the other hand, the reporter has himself or herself a number of obligations in order to ensure the protection and the confidentiality, the secrecy of the personal data of other persons as established by the law. So normally when we uh, use the term process, we think of any activity that can be done to a data uh, down to uh, starting with collection, maintenance, storage, um, editing, montage, uh, up to publication. We know that the law was passed in 2015 and the step by step, the culture of personal data protection is coming into being in Armenia, not of course as comprehensively, as strongly as we would want it to be, but the legislation provides sufficient safeguards and guarantees for the reporter to be willing and to ensure the protection of one's own personal data. And on the other hand, to understand how they should work with the personal data of others. Uh, in fact, in the course of conflict coverage, we paid close attention to a number of problematic issues but the most sensitive one and the most vulnerable one in our um, understanding was the names or the identity or the work of the uh, ID data of prisoners of war and their family members. <laughs> and the child wants to say something important. You know, it is really difficult when you have four children at home and you are trying to speak in parallel about very serious matters. So the uh, personal data as it is defined in the legislation or in international documents is any data that enables the identification of a person. This can be the name, the photo, the last name, the medical, the data, uh, political, religious views, any data about the health state of the person, anything about the human being that uh, would identify that person. Let us move on. Now, if we are to come back to the uh, personal data issue of the prisoners of war that I just mentioned, what did we have on the ground and why did we uh, think of them as problematic? So uh, the 
conflict was just over, it was in December, when the media had started to actively cover the process of prison POWs exchange. And during this period of time, unfortunately, different media outlets published the uh, photos and the videos of POWs making use of Azerbaijani, uh, Azerbaijani forces and this photo or video was done in conditions when uh, the person was in very uh, negative uh, and undermined situation very humiliated and we have uh, reported some uh, similar violations in a large number of media outlets. And by the way, here we speak about prisoners of war who were taken as prisoners, not during this 44 day uh, conflict, but had been there in Azerbaijan for quite a long period of time. And uh, they published uh, the photos that were disseminated by the Azerbaijani media right after being taken as a prisoner of war where they are uh, situated, their dignity was undermined and they were in a humiliated situation. Of course, this issue is of major public importance and there is, this is a public domain issue and the media outlets do have a right to write about these matters, but they should on the other hand and by all means take into consideration the fact that such uh, images and such uh, photos may directly hinder the socialist further socialization of prisoners of war because they need to have an opportunity to continue their natural life in uh, the context and behind, uh, against the background of these major issues that they have survived. Of course, reporters may cover the issue and they can support the um, acceleration of peaceful settlement and uh, we can get a peaceful settlement um, as soon as we get but of course these processes are normally uh, accompanied by uh, intervention or at the expense of different individuals including soldiers uh, wounded soldiers prisoners of war etc and uh, uh, surely we need to establish it as a fact that uh, reporters bear a moral obligation to respect the confidentiality and the secrecy and the privacy of the people who have found themselves in the conflict situation at the same time ensuring unbiased and balanced coverage fair coverage and international documents speak about this as well as the journalistic ethical principles uh, impose this but of course we have a lot of things to undertake because we need to have a better and stronger perception that our work should support POWs and should not harm um, you know and should not make their psychological traumas even worse um, all we can do and should do is to support these people to come back to their real social life. And also, I would like to highlight our obligation of children's privacy, because we saw a lot of photos when the POW's um, children, family members were presented. And it seems that in these circumstances, we never asked ourselves whether we should ask for their permission. And in this given context, in this given conditions, yeah, maybe they did not want uh, to be visible, they wanted to be to remain in oblivion. They wanted to be ignored. They uh, did not want to have their status discussed at all. And of course, we should respect this right of theirs if they want to remain in oblivion. At the same time, uh, fulfilling our um, function of providing information to our society. We should take uh, into account uh, their right of not becoming visible. And also, I often raise this issue, stating that this is a crucial point, especially when you're working on the internet, because if I post uh, a name, a settlement name, a photo, or a 
video record is to uploaded, it will be almost impossible to delete it from the internet. So uh, forever, this data is going to be available on the internet and they might be used in various um, contexts. By the way, we also say that reporters are often guided by the thought that if any data is published online before them, they already have free uh, freedom to reprint, republish this data without uh, without bothering to live up to their obligation of getting the consensus of the person who the, uh, was the bearer or the owner of this data. In any case, if you are posting, reposting something on the net, if you, uh, this is still is an intervention in one's privacy, just as is the case with the first post. And naturally, and consequently, we're somehow doubling it up or quadrifying or uh, making it worse, multiplying the effects. So uh, in this sense, in practical situations, it is almost impossible to avoid such cases, especially since we are all passionate about the situation. And this is everybody's hard take and we want to somehow support the process with our journalistic activity. But very often this sensitivity by itself, the sensitivity of the topic and the emotions around it make us, uh, make us um, undervalue and underestimate certain things, certain priorities. And this can be detrimental to POWs and their family members, and especially their children who are minors, whose photos we recently saw were widely and broadly disseminated. Now, if we're to come back to the issue, let us move on. Here I have presented the most important principles that the legislation stipulates and we as reporters have to follow and comply with uh, soon a bit, a bit before we were speaking about lawfulness and this is the number one thing that we need to be guided by when we publish personal data and on the screen you can see the principle of proportionality and there are a number of points that I would like to single out. The first one is that are really applied to make use of the minimum volume of personal data necessary for the, uh, attaining our pro professional objective. In our case, it is, of course, the journalistic duty and our obligation to provide information to the public. If, for example, it is possible to make use only of the name of the person participating or involved in the conflict and inform the public about this. This means that this is the amount or the volume that we should be using. But if we feel that, for example, the impact of our story will be undermined, uh, we may uh, publish the photo too. Maybe we could or we must publish the photo, but we could uh, blur it a little bit so that it would be difficult to identify the given person. So the important point here is not to focus on who the person is, but rather we are covering the event. And in this case, we may simply refrain from publishing photos where the person may be identified and may be recognized by friends or family. And naturally, the maximum intervention happens when we publish a recording where the person is just obviously seen in the conditions which he or she is portrayed in. So we start with the min minimum possible volume of information, and then we keep ask, uh, asking ourselves information, moving in the expansion logic until we arrive at the solution of our journalistic assignments. Of course, a component of this proportionality principle is that 
you should not collect and maintain and disseminate and process personal data that are not necessary for your primary and direct goals of data processing. That is to say, we should not simply get interested and collect data about people uh, if this data or the need for that does not stem from your story. So, for example, you sit there and say, oh, let me ask a few questions about the medical state. Let me ask a few questions about their children's education. So we do not have a right to collect this information unless it stems from the uh, topic of our story or our primary objective. Okay, let us move on to the next component of proportionality. And this is where we will start. I already spoke about depersonalization or anonymization, and actually the baseline situation is the anonymized use of uh, data or personal data, which will uh, be a barrier or will prevent recognition or identification of the person by acquaintances, family members, friends. Whenever it is possible to anonymize the data, then in this case, uh, we should go for it. If we feel that uh, the impact of our story will uh, be undermined, if the right of the public to get information will be undermined, uh, we start uh, going back to identified uh, persons and uh, identify them using the data and do this with little steps every time asking ourselves whether this is absolutely indispensable. Also, we need to uh, consider another aspect of proportionality, uh, whether uh, thinking whether uh, how, how many subjects we need to have, how many characters do we need to portray. If we're writing about old POW, uh, we do not necessarily have to present their families. If we are writing something about the feelings of uh, POW's family members, then yes, you can de depict them in their apartment, in their home, you can talk to them about their feelings and you can present details. But if we're speaking about the process of returning POWs, I think that in this case we should not uh, bring uh, the state of mind of the person's minor children uh, and their emotions. Of course, once again, I would like to reiterate that this depends largely on the focus that you have selected for your story. And uh, as much as possible, the persons involved in the story and their uh, personal data should be of minimal volume. And the last point. And the most important uh, reliability com uh, component is uh, the information or the data that we collect about uh, individuals should be updated, they should not be false, they should not be incomplete or obsolete. So the law stipulates that we are obliged to work with complete, full and updated information. Moreover, the information, the data that we publish cannot be falsified, cannot be fake uh, and hence uh, could discredit the person. Uh, there are a number of practical principles that I have spelled out here, and it is possible that I spoke too much, but I will quickly cover these two. So I think that the most important uh, recommendation and advice I can give to you is that you should be honest to the people. You should not manipulate with their honesty, unawareness, and the law generally says that before publishing people's personal data, we should get their consensus, it should be consensual. And naturally, we could have materials or stories where it is pointless to receive the person's consent. And it can, in general, hinder the creation of your story. And in this case, we can be guided by by the law on mass media, part one, article seven, it uh, sets out an imperative requirement um, 
prohibiting the dissemination of information that can undermine the privacy uh, and the secrecy of one's private life or family life. And the second part, uh, the third part says that we can publish data uh, on this uh, one's private life if this is reported to protect public interest. Public interest can be interpreted in different sectors, but in our professional sector and field of activity, I have uh, made use of BBC's code of conduct, and BBC, for its own so journalistic environment, has identified what public interest is, especially in terms of secrecy of private life, and where it could be, it could override uh, uh, human uh, uh, human right to privacy. And I have uh, put them up here. It is the detection of um, crime, uh, rioting, anti-social anti activity, uh, protection of uh, people's health and security, the publication of information that can help people make decisions in uh, publicly important matters. And public interest is existent and overrides every, uh, all other points. Uh, in the context of freedom of expression. So if people do certain anti-social activity, we can refer to Article 7, Part 3 of the Law on Freedom of Expression. Uh, and we can say that since there is um, an overriding public interest, then we are not inclined to receive the preliminary uh, consensus. Uh, of the consent of the person uh, for publishing their personal data. By the way, uh, you should get this consent at the very moment when you are planning to collect personal data of a person. So that you should start uh, with uh, getting the consent ever since you already generate the idea of collecting information. So there are a few important and necessary steps. First of all, we need to understand what kind of personal data we're working with at the moment, because it's possible that there might be publicly available data. And when working with them, we do not necessarily have to receive anybody's preliminary and prior consent. And now these are the official registers, yellow pages, uh, in announcements, in declarations of income and assets of uh, officials. So these are this is already information that is published, is publicly accessible. And if we're making use of this data, we do not have bear the obligation of receiving prior consent. But if the information is not publicly accessible or available, we need to discuss uh, with ourselves, is it lawful if we uh, publish the person's per personal data without consent? If we are convinced that there is uh, overriding public interest that will justify our use of that data without any prior consent, then we make this decision and we publish the data uh, with a reference to part three, article seven of the law on freedom of expression. My question is also true about situations with children. So whatever I'm saying does not necessarily have to be limited to the behavior that is expected or anticipated from us in conflict situations. I'm speaking about all possible situations when we are publishing data about this or that person in our materials. This could be top officials, high-ranking officials. This could be public figures, sports uh, people, athletes, cultural figures, or any other person who is in the center of the public, in the focus of the public. And we should once again understand what needs to be done if your own personal data is infringed on. For example, your neighbor is um, 
for surveilling on you uh, with a um, camera uh, over your or their door or for example if you see that someone is trying to attack to hack your facebook account so whatever it is be it in the virtual world or in the physical world and you can see that there is a danger of uh, in terms of the protection of your personal data you should know that the republic of armenia has a personal data protection uh, agency and their mandate is to safeguard the protection of personal data and if there is a violation of the law uh, to, to reinstitute and restore such protection and such data. It was created in 2019. And by the way, you can go to the agency in the second case when you go to a specific public body, for example, to get some information, for example, data on officials, bonuses, travels, etc., or their family members and will receive recusals. We can directly uh, appeal these inquiries in the agency of personal data protection and we can ask them to launch an action and to uh, settle your claim in the dispute and uh, there are two cases when the agency intervenes uh, if there is an application by a journalist submitted to the agency or on their own initiatives so they can take an initiative to check compliance with the processing procedures in this or that sector for example we used to check compliance of data processing in the schools um, to the provisions of the law. No one really asked us to do this, but we had identified that we had some surveillance related issues. And in this case, the agency uh, launched this action uh, by its own initiative and started an investigation on finding out the situation in relation to the protection of personal data. And speaking about responsibility, you should really try to fully make use of all the mechanisms and the mandate and authority that the agency is granted by the law in both cases, either when uh, your right to receive information on public figures and political figures is violated. And the second one, when uh, your privacy right is violated. Maybe uh, uh, this sanction does not seem very large uh, per bridge. It is from 50 to 500,000 drums, but we should not forget that the agency can repeat uh, the uh, imposition of such an administrative section on a daily basis before the violation and its impact are eliminated. And in this sense, uh, it, the decision of the agency may have a huge impact. So this much I tried to really rush through the major aspects of personal data protection. And besides the fact that we can all turn to a state body for support, I would also advise or recommend you should go to local organizations, but also you could go to international journalistic organizations for support. For example, Committee to Protect Journalists, or for example, Reporters Without Borders. All these organizations also interfere in all those cases when you know, the right to the privacy of journalists' lives as subjects are violated by different authorities, by different government, governments, because there are countries where uh, the government is governments are starting secret surveillance and actually in this country's journalists need a lot of support thank you very much uh, i will gladly take your questions on personal data okay thank you shushan for uh, this detailed presentation and i think uh, our attendees if we would like we can send them the presentation also we are going to have this um on the YouTube channel of Foika, right? So I, I already see that we do have two questions to uh, Tom and 
uh, Woody, I will uh, translate the question. So one of the journalists is asking, uh, is it mandatory? Is it uh, important to have flak jacket and helmet? Uh, because in her case, it was too heavy. And during uh, taking this flak jacket and also a helmet, she uh, understood that she's actually making slow the team and it, it is harder for her and the team to go to the shelter. So what do you think? Is it mandatory? It's a must? Yeah, who wants to react first? Maybe, yeah, I see uh, Tom already unmute her himself. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, it's not mandatory in the sense that there is, you know, any specific regulations or laws around it. But I sort of get what your question is, as I would say, it's very much preferable to do. It doesn't mean that you can't do it, but I would advise anyone in the circumstances that they are able to procure body armor. Um, also, there, there, are, there are different kinds of body armor as well, uh, and some of them are much lighter and much more easy to deal with than others. There's also, I think it, this is the kind of time where, as we spoke a little bit about physical fitness, whether people uh, need to look at things like whether they can do whether I, I myself did a little did endurance training before I went out to any particular war zones. Um, this is my, one of the cases where you might want to take endurance training or some kind of strength training. And so it's not absolutely essential, but it's very much, I'd say very, very much recommended. And again, because a lot of the, especially I'm assuming this is a question coming from Artsakh, but um, war in which a lot of the material was, was very kind of one size fits all. And it was sometimes made for soldiers that you might see if you can just simply find uh, uh, personal, personalized ones that more fit your size or, or the other things you have on you. I don't know if Moody, you have any, any opinions of your own. Yeah, I, I certainly think that it is absolutely important to, if it is an active war zone, you must have a flak jacket on your body and you must have a helmet in your head because you never know what kind of shrapnel is going to fly towards your body, horizontally speaking, and you never know what kind of shrapnel is going to fall into your head, vertically speaking, or stones or anything that can anything that can possibly injure you is going to slow the process of you getting to safety. So you and your crew, so you don't want to have that, to give that a chance in any given circumstance. And if it is too heavy for you, that means you're not physically fit and prepared to go in a war zone. So please do not go. Conflict reporting is not to get famous, is not to get to have some sort of excitement. It is a matter of you to witness, document or report what's going on and leave as early as possible if there is danger for you to be there. Yeah, thank you for honest answers. Uh, and actually, uh, there is like a follow up question to this, but from another actually uh, attendee. So uh, they are asking both of you, uh, Tom and Woody, what is like the forcing of your motivation? to go to the conflict zones, to go to the foreign countries just for covering conflict because you are facing each second a threat to your life. What is this uh, forcing motivation to you? Nicholas, do you want to talk? <laughs> uh, you took a, a, you, I, I'm still thinking about my answer. I, why don't you take this and for a little bit and then I'll... Yeah, from my, from my, I think it's, it's very personal. And from my angle, it's, I just feel like for me, it's home everywhere. And for me, whatever people are suffering, that's the suffering I want to be there. A witness document, a report, and possibly deliver an impact in the other part of the world, whatever there is peace and there is no suffering for people to reflect and try to stand up and 
do whatever they feel is the right thing to do about what they read. And uh, as, as I would do whatever I felt it was the right thing to do when I read something's happening somewhere else. And I just appreciate so much whenever I read a piece of story or see a picture of somebody have shot or produced from a war zone because that gives me an understanding about what's going on somewhere else. And that gives me an opportunity for me to do something and to, to put a purpose in my life. Yeah, thank you, Woody. So I would, I would say there are a lot of similar motivations to that. And that one thing that keeps a lot of, of conflict journalists going in their particular jobs is that for all of the, the suffering you can see or for the own the hazard it brings to your to your personal lives, it is a it is a profession with a good deal of purpose to it. It is something where you feel that you can make a difference, whether it's making a difference even to just the lives of the indip individual people you come across by telling their stories, whether uh, it's bringing wider attention, whether it's documenting the historical record, whether it's in some cases recording crimes that can be used as criminal evidence. I know that in Artsakh, in the uh, aftermath of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, there is a lot of submissions going to like various European courts over potential crimes that have been committed. And it is a, in a way, I think people who do this job are, are a very particular kind of people who are drawn to wanting to be at the site where the most intense suffering and actions are going on so that they can report and they can document them both for the current generation and for a further generation as well. Yeah, thank you for the answers. Uh, once again, uh, I would like to give floor to the participants, attendees, journalists who have questions. So please, if you have question, just raise your hand or type the question in a chat and I will give you floor to ask the question. At this moment, I see no questions, but if you have questions, please let us know, okay? Any questions? There are no questions also in a chat. So in this regard, ah. Uh, yeah, sure. I would I... like to ask a question. I would like to ask our colleagues, have you ever had to forget that you're a reporter and participate in the offensive or in the war actions to protect, to defend yourselves or to help some wounded soldiers or a situation when you have to give up journalism and do something else when the war is happening right in front of you. Thank you. Um. I'm I'm happy to take to take the question uh, for now, and that would, in my case, be a no. And it's also the case that you should absolutely, as far as possible, avoid avoid getting in any sort of situation where you could potentially be seen as a combatant and thereby lose your journalistic objectivity and not only that forfeit your rights as a uh, as a journalist and a neutral observer there was one particular case i believe it was in afghanistan about 10 or so years ago where a former member of the Dutch Marines uh, was, they, was, was embedded with uh, special forces and they were ambushed and a colleague was killed and because he had training he picked up a rifle and tried to fight the insurgents off. Now that's a very particular and specific situation and 
I don't want particularly want to judge his behavior because, you know, I wasn't there at the time and I don't know what the situation was like or how dangerous it could have been. But one cardinal rule for journalists is that you should certainly never pick up is some kind of weapon you could, because then you can justifiably be targeted as a potential enemy combatant. Uh, now, the, the question of having to give uh, aid is another. Now, this is a, a sort of thing that every journalist should have some very basic first aid training. But again, it's the sort of case where it should any sort of uh, any sort of medical treatment should always be given by a trained medical professional. And as a journalist, you should only ever do it in the absolute last resort. If someone's, you know, life is at stake and there happens to be no professionals around. Budi, is, is this your experience? Yeah. So the answer to that is no, no, and no. Do not ever think about getting involved in conflict in any given way and circumstance, regardless of what happened. Uh, you have to stick to the fact that you're there to witness document or report and that's it. And in terms of involvement, in terms of fair, first aid, as, uh, as, as uh, Nicholas says, you might want to choose to involve only if you're absolutely the last resort and only if your involvement means you're saving a life of someone that's injured. By keeping the fact in mind, that the first aid kit that you are carrying with you, which is absolutely necessary to have it all the time, that's probably the one you're gonna be using on an injured person. And that's, if you do that, that means you're leaving yourself without any single card of possibly surviving a potential injury that you might experience throughout the process of getting out to the safe zone. So it's very subjective choice. Uh, the normal preferences do not get involved. But again, it's a choice you have to make. And it's a judgmental call of the moment you have to, you have to do in the, on, on, on the circumstance you are. Yeah, thank you, both of you, for answering to the question. I see there are no raised hands, so... I'm very thankful to you for this detailed answer. And one more question, uh, Harutun. May I ask just another question? In any case, in emergency situations in conflict zones, the behavior and the activity of a reporter and the potential sequence of the actions uh, could be described in specific textbooks. But shall we assume that there are situations where the journalist should look for the answers and for solutions for getting all the recommendations provided in the textbook? Uh, I didn't quite understand the question. It, Shall which... you always be guided by textbook uh, instructions, whatever you're taught as a journalist, or are there real life situations where you need to give up that content, forget your knowledge and be guided by the situation? Uh, there was a translation. Are you okay? Shall I repeat the question again? Or? Could you rephrase it, please? Um, do you have examples or are there, are there any situations when you need to be guided by your intuition and by your experience rather than whatever you are taught by textbooks? Oh. Yeah, well, Nick, do you want to say or? I mean, <laughs> We should probably start with the fact that textbooks on, you know, the textbooks on conflict reporting are not, you know, it, there's not a detailed list of things that you need to do in the moment in the sense that every situation is very different. And often you'll have to be guided by your instincts simply because your instincts are there with you on the ground and they are the only things that can cover the particular situation. 
uh, it's it, it's one of those things where you should probably be guided more by your intuition and your knowledge of the situation. Uh, textbook learning is is something that, if I'm honest anyway about textbook learning, I think I've always thought that journalism is more of a trade than a profession. And uh, what I mean by that is that it's something where you get more experience in the field field on the ground than you do learning from any kind of, of book or any kind of, of courses. They are there as a sort of a foundation that will help you. But I would say your personal ex it also because conflict reporting is or, or reporting in general, but especially conflict reporting is a very personal experience. And you need to know the certain things that work for you. That said, there are certain ethical guidelines as, as journalists that we should all follow. For instance, things that said that uh, talking about Shushan spoke about about uh, data protection and protection of sources and knowing what particular sort of physical and emotional limits you have uh, so with that you should be as flexible with as you can within those sort of rules although it can be kind of hard to answer the question properly unless you have like a specific example or a specific scenario in mind where we could sort of say well this is how i'd approach it yeah. i would like to also add that books are written from people who have gained knowledge through all their experiences on the ground so they could be a very good guiding point for you to have as much information as possible and be equipped with such information of a experience of an individual that decided to write a book about. <laughs> However, there is never a there is never a same situation in, in anywhere you go. So there's always going to be something different. That's that's why it's important to like have so have this kind of hostile environment training course and, and battlefield medical response which is like the very fundamental information that you need to know in order to then use your instinct and and the knowledge of the actual information which are up to date when you are on the ground and then make decisions on the move as you go yeah thank you both for answering to the question. Uh, do we have a follow-up from Mr. Martirosian or uh, they gave full comprehensive answer to the question? All I need to say is thank you because I received detailed answers. Okay, so uh, I see there is a question in a chat uh, and the question exactly regarding to the conflict reporting, which you did in Artsakh and from Artsakh. So uh, the journalist is asking, have you faced situations when the Armenian political and military uh, authorities uh, didn't allow you to publish any information or piece of article which you had? Uh, I, I mean, I, I suppose I will take this one first because I, I was Dur there during the war and the answer is I found that in general the Armenian authorities were pretty pretty good about this sort of thing I remember that before we before we were allowed to publish or film anything uh, or, or publish you know the photographs or videos that were filmed we were some minders would check to make sure that they hadn't given away any sort of military position or anything like that but I never had any and I don't know of anybody there's one exception there's one case of a Russian journalist who has had his accreditation denied to re-enter arts up, but I don't really know the details of that story, so I don't really want to uh, sort of uh, put say too much about it. But it wasn't the experience, or to, for the most part, the experience of my colleagues that we were obstructed in any in any major way. And certainly, uh, most of the journalists I think had, as far as possible, a reasonably positive experience. And I know that wasn't necessarily the case with journalists who operated in in Azerbaijan. Now, I don't want to. We have to be very careful here, and I'm sure Vudi would agree 
that as foreign reporters, we are often treated differently and we are treated with a bit more leniency than a local reporter may be. So there is very, it is very possible that local reporters face pressure, whether from authorities or from their communities, that we as, as sorry, I, I hate to say it, but it is true when people say, you know, foreigner privilege is that we do have a sort of privilege in that if that we can just make more noise or we can get you know foreign governments involved in some sort of situations where local journalists are coming under much much more pressure if you look at the statistics i think of journalists who face harassment or or threats or even deaths from their work, it's about 90% of them are local journalists or fixers. So I had a personally pretty good experience and so did most of my foreign colleagues, but I don't want to generalize that to everyone, potentially Armenian or Artsakhi, who also report from the conflict zone. Yeah, I... I think that the information, the, the, the accessible information is something that is predetermined by the government policy. Depends whether the government on a particular period of time of a wars, wartime or after wartime, whatever they feel and they think that this certain information should never go out or this other information should go out, they will grant you access whether you are a local or a foreign reporter. I do agree with Nick that there is a particular privilege being a foreign reporter in a foreign country because you you, you kind of are, are given more access than the local reporters and you're less kind of likely to be pressured in certain circumstances. Although I, do, I, did, I did experience some sort of pressure being there and I did experience a, a blockade of information and certain issues that were related to a potential evidence of crime and war crime against humanity. I could not understand, and I do not understand to this day, why the Armenian government authorities decided to reject me access to people that were uh, injured with phosphor weapon and people that were buried in mass graves in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh region, and the process of identification of the bodies that were that were that were that were killed during the war. Uh, so these were informations that I was denied access to. And um, that, I guess, it's a, it's, it's a government policy that they do decide based on the tree, on, on certain public or not public agreements with certain other probable uh, authorities in, in, in other countries that they might feel close to, that they decide to not or not, or, or to publish certain information or grant access to foreign reporters about it. I'd actually just like to add one very quick thing there. I left, uh, I'm, I left Armenia and Karabakh at the very end of last year. And I have heard reports from people on the ground that say the information situation uh, with, with regarding to access to information on the Armenian side has gotten worse. In particular, access to Karabakh has gotten significantly more difficult. Uh, I, I'm planning to be back in Armenia later and I'll be able to judge that for myself. But yeah, they're, 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 the signs are unfortunately a little bit discouraging at the moment. Uh, I think during the war, the Armenian government had just so many other things on its mind that it was thinking about, about how to defend the country but or, 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 or Karabakh. But, and so it didn't really bother with, with too closely worrying about what journalists were and were not doing, but that it's gotten a, with a more stricter environment. And to be honest, with those of us who have covered post-Soviet conflict zones, we sometimes know that when the Russians get heavily involved, these things become a little bit trickier. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you uh, for answering to the questions. Maybe we have some addition from Shushan. Of course, uh, she was not uh, reporting, but maybe there have been cases that uh, when freedom of information or freedom of spreading information was somehow uh, not allowed by the authorities. Yeah. 
Yes, we had serious issues during the war in terms of access uh, um, to information as well as uh, dissemination of information. Maybe this was justified in terms of the rejections to the inquiries made by local journalists. And we remember that 13 media outlets were sanctioned for the content that was not in compliance with the limitations under the martial law and these uh, fines were from 30,000 to 70,000 crumbs and they were not very terrible um, manifestations and we made a public statement at the same time condemning the government for their attempt and for the tactic of administering fines in order to address the issue. But on the other hand, it was not a large scale undertaking. This is something we should confess. And at the same time, uh, international media outlets uh, were uh, very seriously restricted by Azerbaijan. Factually, Azerbaijan had prohibited the access of any international organization from their territory to the front line, and almost all international media organizations were fed by information with, uh, from or due to the Armenian authorities. And they were making use of our territory in order to access the front line and to fulfill their professional duties. And actually, in his in its own country, uh, limiting access to social media, um, flow of information, banning the access of international media outlets to the front line. Azerbaijan, on the other hand, was targeting and was. Uh, bombing uh, media representatives was trying to establish total control over content and information, um, not allowing reporters to see what was in fact happening on the ground and to inform the world around it. I'm really uh, sad about this fact that Budi mentioned this uh, for the second time that the Armenian authorities did not let him access and interview the force force um, to, to, to access and to talk to the military and the soldiers who were always were burned this phosphorus weapon because and this is not understandable to me because it is in our interest to have the international community becoming aware of uh, this uh, war crimes that were uh, undertaken against us and this would be things that would be reflected in the human rights watch and other human rights organizations i think that this was a strategic mistake i do not know what their motivation for this rejection was but i think that this rejection was um, unacceptable and especially now when the environmentalists and activists are now alarm beating the alarm saying why the state had not undertaken specific measures in order to appeal the use of these phosphorus weapons uh, in any international instance. That is to say, on the one hand, it did not allow the reporters and journalists to cover or uh, alert the international society, uh, community about this. On the other hand, they did not undertake such measures themselves as a sovereign state. So I largely condemn our authorities in this regard. Shushan, it is really difficult to think that um, it is really hard to believe that we had someone who would really ban access to these people because it seems that the Armenian side was supposed to be interested to collect and to present evidence that this was actually a warm crime during the war. And this is a question for Nick and for Woody. Actually, a reporter who is in the war zone uh, has not only to cover the hostilities and the military actions, but also maybe to voice the kind of the war crime. Uh, so the 
they also need to fulfill this function of documenting war crimes at the same time creating certain moods and reactions to them. I'm not sure if I could, could you please re-articulate the, the, the question? Yeah, no, I, I didn't quite it, get it. It's not I... a question, like um, you as a reporter, they're not only to um, cover the hostilities and the military actions, but you're also there to document war crimes and make them known to the international community. This actually, I'm, if I may say, say very quickly, this does sort of suggest a little bit about what I said before, which is that after the war restrictions got tightened, because it was May, I think only about a week to two weeks after the war had ended, we were all invited. Uh, we, we were sent around a, a group email and a group WhatsApp chat saying, well, you need to come to this hospital at this time. We're going, you know, to interview the soldiers who were, who were uh, affected specifically by white phosphorus. And I remember a, a large group of us went and did exactly that. Now, I, I can't think for the life of me why they would then say, oh no, we're, we're shutting this down. But who knows what was going on really behind the scenes. Maybe someone else took over who didn't like uh, journalists poking around too much. Or there was, yeah, it, with, with the political situation as it is, it can be sometimes hard to know who's making these decisions or, or where they're coming from in terms of access. We'd also like to ask Rudy and Nick if you are planning to return to Armenia and if you have problems accessing Artsakh. And why am I speaking about this? Because recently we have had quite a few cases when um, national media representatives complain about limited access to Artsakh because uh, there is some invalid excuses for this. And recently, BBC reporters also uh, announced about this, that unfortunately, they did not, uh, they were not granted access to Artsakh. And perhaps you are aware that uh, they received this visa jointly as based on a joint decision by Artsakh authorities and Russian peacemake, uh, peacekeeping forces and 65 uh, civilians and uh, citizens of different countries, including over 10 journalists, were denied access to Artsakh uh, ever since February to this day. And this is in the focus of Reporters Without Borders and other journalistic organizations. And I know that, Nick, you are planning to come back to Armenia in the near future. And if you try to travel to Artsakh and you face such technical difficulties, please let us know about this case so that we're able to voice this issue and to support you in getting yes. access to well, Artsakh. Yes, I mean, this... this echoes, as I said, a number of difficulties that we've seen in times when Russian peacekeepers are involved. It, for journalists, it's known that the that visiting South Ossetia, the, the, the contested breakaway state in North Georgia, is known to be very, very difficult to work out, and that the Donetsk People's Republic in eastern Ukraine, that's a slightly different scenario are quite difficult to access. Now, actually, before and even during the war, Karabakh was known as being of these sort of uh, post-Soviet frozen conflict zones, the easiest to access. And during the war, I mean, after the war, for instance, literally, even when the peacekeepers had just moved in, we were stopped at one checkpoint, showed our passports and went straight through. We have heard it's gotten much, much more difficult. Uh, a colleague of mine, some of you might follow his work, Neil Hauer, is planning to go to Artsakh uh, over the next few days, and I'll be in contact with him to see whether whether he makes it or not. So, yeah. Just uh, I'll, a I'll small keep you clarification on the access to Artsakh. Actually, the authorities are asking for foreign journalists to have accredited uh, fixers. Accredited fixers uh, from the uh, MFA, so Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and this is a new thing. And we do have the updated page at the MFA website of Armenia. And 
they are actually uh, giving licenses to the fixers. You know, you have been in Arta and for uh, having a fixer, there was no much things, you know, uh, you, you just try to find a local who is ready to go there and have this kind of, you know, danger uh, faced in Artsakh. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, they, they do have some connection with uh, government or here, uh, there should have actually connection with the government because there should be licensed as a fixer to work with the foreign media. This is a novelty actually starting from March. This was done, this update. So please be careful when trying to visit Artsakh. I have everything ready beforehand, trying to find these accredited fixers. I don't know anyone, by the way. So, my, my yeah. yeah, go ahead, Nick, sorry. I just have a feeling that you may, might be able to say something similar. Uh, understand, I understand sort of on paper the rules, but I don't think any journalist jumps for joy when they hear that we have to have a state accredited fixer, especially with the contrast of what it was like during and before the war. I mean, what does a state accredited fixer mean? Someone who's got, means someone with close ties to the state who is more likely to show you what the authorities want you to see. So how much of it is a fixer and how much is a minder, right? Yeah. So first of all, I, I do have a subjective experience uh, during the time when I was in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh region in Artsakh and out for the first time. I could see there is a constant intensity, intense intensity of trying to get you to write in a form and a narrative that's politically biased. And then if that intention fails, which in this case, in my case, did fail, uh, in the second time when I made my attempts to go, it was far more difficult to get the accreditation. And I did understand that. And the pressure intensity increased incredibly far more than it was for the first time. Um, if I may, Vudi, when did you try to go? I went twice in in, uh, in Nagorno Karabakh region. First, it was in December. Second, was in January. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And um, the idea of government accredited fixers—they are government accredited spies, in my view. You do not go with a government accredited fixer, someone who is vetted by the government. Even these people, even though these people, understandably so, may have been your fixer before and they may have been very genuine and, and, and well-qualified individuals to actually work in a hostile environment zone with you. Uh, and they possibly and probably were independent in the time when you worked with them. Now, after they are accredited by the government, I would not trust that fixer to go with me. First, it's my safety. Second, it's the privileged information that that fixer is going to, to access. It is against professional code of conduct and ethics to, act, to, to, to have with you as a journalist, a government accredited fixer who will be inter interpreting with you and for you a conversation that you're going to have with a potential victim and a potential eyewitness of a potential crime that may have been committed by the government authorities at the very government you're talking about that it's, 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 it's coming from the host country and vice versa. And you are incredibly endangering the whole uh, process of gaining the story and you are putting in danger people who are talking to you as a journalist trusting that you are not going to put them in danger because as Shushan said earlier in terms of personal data and the privacy it is a matter and a responsibility of you as a journalist to protect in case you foresee that that information that you're given and trusted to by an eyewitness can actually go in the wrong hands. So no to government accredited fixer, please find a fixer that you can vet yourself and you can have an understanding of where things are going. And I can see that now based on those conversations and of course what I've been experiencing throughout the two times that I've been going through in Artsakh, it is an intention to control information and that is a wrong decision a wrong way to go 
because the more you intend to control information, the more darkness is going to hit that region. And the more darkness in the politics means less politicians accountable. Less politicians accountable means more potential crimes, more sufferings of the people, and everybody's just gonna get away with crime. And we, as a human society, whatever they, wherever they are, be it in London, in Armenia, Yerevan, or Atsak, we don't want that. And therefore, we should fight refuse and reject such kind of offers, such kind of ways and circumstances that the government intends to offer and create for us to work if we want to force them to change. Yeah, I totally got what you said and I hope our attendees also would have questions regarding to this. I see that we have a question from one of the attendees. Satin, please take the floor. Um, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have you ever had psychological problems as a result or in the aftermath of your coverage? And have you ever uh, gone to a professional? For, have you ever gone for professional health and was this covered by yourself or by your um, media organization? Who paid for that? Talking therapy is always important uh, after, after a possible intense conflict that you've been reporting. Uh, it's really important to write things down and it's really important to you go to a talking therapist. In, but it's okay to take some time and observe yourself what's happening and be cautious and be, be mind, mindful to your own self. Uh, and then, you know, if, if you feel like something is wrong comparing to before, then you definitely should, leave, should, should seek professional support for your mental and emotional well being uh, up to a level where you might need also cognitive behavior therapy, which is something I always practice if things go a little bit down south. So I always had a talking therapist in every single case that I traveled in the war. Um, of course, if, if the war was less intense, then it was just something that I got used of, so it was okay. However, returning from Armenia, I needed a talking therapist and I had to go through it. Um, uh, just a moment, I've, I've had a few latency and bandwidth issues, just checking that you can hear me and that I'm coming through. Yeah, we hear you. Yes, 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 yeah. we hear you. Okay, I, I zoned, uh, my connection broke for a little bit, but the, I heard, if I wasn't mistaken, that the question and answer was about psychological therapy or psychological harm that was, that, that, that you received, you know, and I, I think it's interesting, the question of, of whether uh, an organisation has paid for it or not. No, I didn't after I came back from Armenia. However, I can certainly understand why people would, and it's not any sort of criticism against the people of Armenia to say that after the war, it was a very, it was a tough place to work, not so much because of, is because we were just out surrounded by an enormous amount of suffering. Um, everybody we knew had known people who had lost people during the war. And, you know, you would, I, I think there were times that, you know, I would go out for, you know, drinks with my friends from the war. They were, I would say about on most occasions, someone would start crying within an hour or so, just when they were remembered as someone that they lost or someone that they knew. I think it's, it's quite hard for people who weren't in Armenia to understand the extent to which the entire society was was completely shocked and bewildered and and wounded after what happened in the war. So I mean, it's a it's a case of one of those things where I personally didn't, but I can certainly understand why people would have wanted to. And it also makes me feel if that was the way that I and other reporters were feeling after after the conflict when we don't have loved ones that could have been injured or killed, how much difficult it must have been for, for the locals who are often more overlooked than I think even we are. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, you. It's not, it's yeah, not sorry, sorry. Sorry, I need to go over there, yeah. All right. Yeah, just just to support Nick when it says it's not crit you, you deciding to go and need a need a talking therapist for, for you for your own mental and emotional well being is not criticism for the nation of the country. It's just you've you've seen a lot 
suffering and 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 you you need to you need to release it and you and you and and some people may be okay some people may need professional support to get through it and process it so so yeah that's very normal yeah and thanks both for honest answer to this question sometimes you know people are not sharing these kind of things and overall we come to the end of our webinar for the journalists armenian journalists just want to remind that during four weeks uh with the uh cooperation of foica and the Yerevan state university we had uh, three sessions for student journalists or students from faculty of journalism. Uh, three different speakers have meeting with students. And today we had a joint, like a round table discussion, round table in the new means, you know, in front of Zoom. So uh, with our speakers for journalists. So thank you all for participating. Thank you for the speakers. Um, being with us, uh, sharing their experience for sure. I will give you floor for like uh, your ending speech or something if you want to add and you haven't said about this. And thank you for uh, translation to Christine. Uh, she managed to translate from Armenian into English from English into Armenian and thank you our journalists who find time during this late at night in Yerevan by the way uh, join yeah join to the meeting and uh, as this is my last word I wish you all happy Easter with your families and of course we are impatiently waiting for your next visit to Armenia which is really uh, we enjoy our friendship, our uh, cooperation very much. Uh, both of you are high professionals and we really would like to see you here again. And um, so thank you very much for being with us, um, not only today, but in the last few months. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk back again with journalists and, and students. And uh, yeah, it's just just really important to 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 remind ourselves to to be safe and make sure we're fit mentally and physically, and with knowledge that we need to stay alive. Because if we're not alive, there is nobody to tell the story. So we must make sure for that reason alone. Yeah. So I guess from my perspective, I would say as well as that a lot of people, especially when we're talking about journalism in in sort of uh, zones of conflict or of crisis or of trauma, the tendency can to, can be to talk very, very negatively about our experiences and talk about the, the, the hazards and everything, everything that can go wrong. But there is also the fact that this profession can be extremely rewarding and extremely life changing and you can meet an, a lot of incredible and amazing people and, and places and that for people who do think about getting involved in this profession line of work seriously, yes, you do need to think about it very, very carefully, but whether, you, whether you're cut out for it or whether it is something you can cope with, but that there are really great rewards for choosing to go down this profession. And and so thank you very much for your interest in, in both the job and for in both of our talks and best of luck with your future careers. Thank you to all. Mr. Martirosian seems to want, uh, want to make his final speech. I just would like to thank uh, Foika and Shushan Doidoya for this beautiful initiative. Thanks to Harutun for his high professionalism and this interactive moderation. Thanks to the translator interpreter who seems to be the master of uh, whatever she's doing. And thanks to our guests. Thanks to guest speakers Woody and Nick who shared their knowledge and their experience with our very dear students, and I'm convinced that our students uh, loved your speeches and your presentations, and they will be looking forward to having you in our university. 
it's the journalism department. You once again proved that journalism is one of the best professions in the world. It is an interesting profession and it is one, it may also be one of the most difficult and dangerous occupations, but still we love it and many, many generations are still to come selecting the difficult paths of journalism being guided by you as role models, Nick and Woody, and other brilliant people like you. Thank you, and I wish you a very good evening, and stay well, and we should have the hope that one day conflict and wars will come to the end, and humans will start peacefully coexisting with each other. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye.